Good morning, students. Welcome to Java Programming Workshop. My name is Fawad, and I'll be going through this workshop with you. And I'll try to ensure that it's not just one-sided, me talking and you listening. Perhaps while the session is going on, we'll take breaks where we will ask uh, you, the participants, to do some coding as well. Okay, I've, I've given you some sample codes, and you can take those sample codes. We don't have to type. You ha can just copy and paste and execute your programs. Okay? So today's workshop uh, is going to comprise certain uh, contents and these are actually uh, uh, shown to you in point format. I'll go through the history, uh, what exactly is Java. Uh, we'll go through JDK. I'm sure that most of you have, have already down, downloaded and installed the software. Okay. The software is JDK, Java Development Kit. And then we'll also go through the class and construct the concept. Now, usually when we study programming, uh, the object-oriented concepts is dealt with at the uh, middle or near to the end of the session, but not with Java, because in Java, the basic program has a class, okay? Yeah, we'll, we'll be touching on these so that you understand it better. That's why uh, we are going to cover uh, the basic class and construct a concept because we're gonna implement this in our Java program in the beginning itself, okay? You cannot have a Java program without a class, okay? Then we will be going into data types and variables, and then we'll be going into control structure. And finally, we'll be touching a little bit on inheritance. Okay. Now, uh, before we start this workshop, does anyone has anything to say, any expectations that you have from this workshop? Any special expectations that you have from this workshop that after this workshop, I want to learn perhaps something that you haven't learned before, or perhaps some component of Java that you, you would like to know about. Anyone? Okay. Um, <clears throat> what, what we can do is I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, go through these uh, workshop, um, Assuming that most of you have got some programming experience. If you don't have, it's okay as well. Uh, I'll explain to you the codes and I'll be doing some coding over here as well. So you can see, even if I make mistakes, we can rectify it and so on. Okay. So let's start our session with the interesting and easy concept of history. Maybe not easy, but interesting. Okay. So let's look at history of Java. Where did it all come from? Okay. If you look at the history of programming languages, you can see actually uh, right from beginning, you can see we have got uh, 1940s, we had machine language, just numbers, and then we had got assembly language, basic commands. And then in the 50s, we had an introduction to high level languages, okay? Uh, well, in the form of uh, uh, Fortran, COBOL, Lisp, and so on, formula translator, common business oriented language. In the 70s and 80s, the whole new paradigm came into existence, okay? Specifically with the introduction of this programming language, C programming language, okay? everything changed once this was introduced, okay? And then in the 1990s, we had, you know, the advent of 
in the 80s, we had the advent of uh, C++, which was an add-on on C. It took C and modified it. And then C++ was modified and Java was created. Okay. So if you look at these programming languages, there is a reason uh, why they are named as such and why um, uh, they are the, very similar to each other because there is an evolution, okay, from one to another. Uh, if you look at our programming language, especially C programming language, it has been modified to C++. And C++ has been modified to Java. That is why if you know C, you know certain percentage of C++ programming, and you know certain percentage of Java programming, okay? So you can actually link the, the language from one to another. You can see that uh, here, for example, if you look carefully over here in C programming language, uh, the concept of uh, no class, okay? Here we don't have any class. No concept of classes, okay? Oh, I just use my mouse. The concept of class is not there. Here we have a concept of class. Here we have a concept of class. Here we can only do structured programming, okay? Only structured programming. Here, you can do structured programming as well as a class programming. That is object-oriented programming. Here, the basic program is object-oriented. So you can see the evolution, okay? The evolution of programming languages, okay? Here, you cannot do structured programming at all, okay? <laughs> you can only do class, okay? So you can see as we go along that um, programming languages, you know, the, the, the way they have been, uh, the evolution of them is also uh, very special. Now, how did all it all came uh, into being? You know, in the early 60s, most of the programming languages, as we said, was uh, uh, assembly language, which was very basic language, okay? And then <clears throat> what happened was, in 1966, uh, this uh, person, Martin Richards, developed a programming language known as Basic Computer Programming Language, BCPL, okay? So all the languages, especially C, C++, and Java, can trace their lineage to BCPL. How? Let's have a look. This person, Ken Thompson, he took BCPL and scaled it down and created a scaled down BCPL and he called it B. Okay, just B. Now, what happened after that was these two persons, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, they developed a new programming language called the C programming language. They took B, modified it because B was not good enough for what project they were doing. And that project was creating a new operating system. What kind of operating system? A multi-user, multi-application operating system named Unix. Okay. They were working at at and uh, company, uh, used to be called Bell Labs, okay? Yes, Bell Labs as the one, uh, the guy who created the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, okay? Uh, so at and they were working for at and If you look at at and and the company, a lot of inventions has come from that company. You know, a lot of... Uh, uh, programming languages that uh, we are using is actually uh, invented uh, by that organization. So anyway, they came out 
Because B was not good enough, they modified B and created a new programming language known as C so that they can create the Unix operating system. Okay? Geniuses. They created the C programming language just so they can create a new operating system. And ever since that, C took off. Okay? This was the computer on which they developed the Unix operating system. This was called a PDP-11. Yes, it's a computer. <laughs> it's not even as powerful as your mobile phones that you're using. <laughs> Look at the size of it, okay? The output used to be seen uh, by looking at the printouts, okay? You, don't, you cannot even see a monitor in here, basic monitor. So this is PDP-11, and this is where they developed the Unix operating system, okay? And that Unix operating system has actually inspired so many other operating systems like uh, your Apple operating system, your Linux, and so on. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> uh, these guys were the ones that, you know, uh, started everything. Now, <clears throat> in early 80s, uh, Bjorn Straustrup, what he did was, what he did was he took C, modified it, okay, and used the object-oriented concepts of other languages and implemented it with C programming language. So he first called it C with classes, and then later on, he modified and called it C++. Plus plus as in the operator, uh, unary operator, which, you know, is like an extension. Okay, so C++ was something new, uh, released in the 80s, and then slowly again it took off. Compared to C programming language, C++ had the concept of object-oriented programming. So programming was much more easier, correct? That means you don't have to type long code. And then in the 90s, okay, uh, we had uh, James Gosling, okay, who was working for Sun Microsystems. Uh, he was given the project to create, to take your C++, modify it, and simplify it, and make a program a, a programming language which is truly platform independent. Why? Why you need a new programming language? Because the issue was with C++ and C, it was not platform independent. If you program on an IBM PC, it can only work on IBM PC. It cannot work on an Apple computer. It cannot work on a mobile device. No, it cannot do that. Furthermore, if you're working on an IBM PC, IBM uh, kind of PC or any kind of PC, depends on the operating system. If you compile a C++ program on a Linux operating system, the executable will work only on Linux, not on Windows. You see where I'm going over here? You see the problem we have? <laughs> that is why they wanted a new programming language that is truly platform independent, can work on any kind of machine. That is why they modified C++ and created the Java programming language. Initially, they called it Oak, okay? And in 2010, Oracle uh, Corporation acquired Sun Microsystems. Okay, so now it's a part of Oracle. And there are many changes to it. You know, initially, uh, Java had, you know, the concept of applets, but now that has also been scraped off. And, you know, uh, if I'm not mistaken, James Gosling resigned from uh, Oracle once it was acquired or uh, if you look at Wikipedia, it says that he resigned in 2010 from Oracle. Okay, so perhaps we have to go and have a look more at it. Anyway, now this is a property of Oracle and it's freely available. You can download the uh, Java development kit, install it on your computer 
and start programming in Java. Okay. The greatest strength of Java is that it can work everywhere from the smallest devices to supercomputers, to your washing machine, to your fridge, to any device, okay? Mobile applications, desktop applications, online applications, anything you can implement Java. That is why Java is very popular. All you have to do is have the main software, which is your Java development kit. Now the question is, what is Java? Why is Java so special? So if you look at the definition of Java, you will see that it is simple, object-oriented, distributed, interpreted, robust, architecture, neutral, portable, high performance, and multi-threaded. You go to Wikipedia, you, it will tell you all these. But what do they mean? Let's go into details, okay? Simple because it does not have the complexities of C++. Those of you who have studied C and C++, one aspect which is biting is memory management pointers. You don't have those in Java, okay? Your Java, uh, uh, you know, your Java uh, uh, details, the machine, Okay, virtual machine takes care of the, those details. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, you don't need to know the internal workings of Java. This could be a positive and a negative thing because sometimes some programs require memory manipulation. So for those programmers, they cannot program in Java. They have to go and program in C or C++. Okay especially programs developed for artificial intelligence and so on, okay? But anyway, Java removes the complexities that we had in C++, okay? Uh, Java is pure object-oriented programming language. Later on, I will be showing you perhaps how you program in C, you see structured programming language. Then when you go to C++, you can do structured as well as you can also do uh, object-oriented, but in Java, it's only object-oriented. The basic program in a Java is a class program. Without class, no program, okay? Now, Java has got another strength. It is compiled as well as interpreted. If you look at the programming languages like C and C++, compiled. Okay, compile languages are usually faster, okay? Java is compiled as well as interpreted. Compile language, the whole code is converted into machine language. Interpreted language, they take line by line. So in Java, you have to first compile, and then when you compile, you create a byte code in the form of a class. And then that class, which is a byte code, can be interpreted into your executable. This makes Java available on all platforms. Okay, all you have to do is install the Java virtual machine on any platform, and your code can be translated. It doesn't matter, any electronic device. Okay? Now, when you move on to other programming languages like Python, Python is purely interpreted language, okay? Not compiled. Executes every line of code and immediately interprets it, okay? Java programs are usually reliable and bug-free, okay? Uh, because one of the things you cannot do is memory manipulation. You cannot mess up with your memory, okay? Yes, Java code, since you convert it into byte code, and the byte code is a class and it can be translated by any Java-enabled machine, 
It is platform independent. That means the program that I compile and interpret over here, I'm using a Windows machine here. If you're using a Linux machine, it will work exactly the same. Okay, It can run on any platform, any operating system, or any machine for that matter, as long as Java is installed and Java Virtual Machine is installed. That's why they say Java code is portable, can be taken from one machine to another machine. Okay, it can be executed on any machine. So when you look at the speed, it is comparable to compiler based languages like C and C because it is also compiled. Okay. In Java, you can do multi-threading. You can have uh, multiple uh, threads, which makes the concept of multi-user and multitasking possible, okay? Now, in order to install Java, you have to go and download it from Oracle Corporation's website, which is your JDK. Now, do we have any students here who do not have JDK on their computer? Anyone? As per the instructions given, uh, you were supposed to first install your JDK. And basically what you do is, you go to your command prompt, okay? And in your command prompt, what you do is just type, uh, sorry, just type over here, Java or Javac, okay? There. If you get a series of these extensions, that means Java is installed, okay? You can also type just Java, okay? Now, the two commands, when you create a program, you have to save it as a .java file. And when you compile it, you type Java, let's say program one dot Java. It compiles it. Once you have compiled it, then you have to interpret it. When you interpret, you just type Java prog one, which is actually a class. Okay, we'll do that later. So, the Java development kit can be downloaded, okay, from the Oracle Corporation, and it has got all the information in it. Uh, all the packages consisting of all the classes are inside here. And once you download this, you can start doing intensive Java programming. Um, you can actually type your Java program uh, on any text editor, okay? Many people use this, te this text editor, which is uh, Eclipse. I don't know whether you have experience with Eclipse, okay? You mention a workspace, and then you can start programming. Or you can also use any, you know, other text editors like Notepad++, or edit pad plus plus. There's so many, you know, the, the, the reason uh, the text editor is important uh, is uh, because you see, as I say over here, the text editor is preferable so that uh, you can isolate the bug line faster. Okay, because if there is an error in your code, since if I just use pure notepad, you see, if I use pure notepad, my problem is when I type code, it doesn't show me the line number, but here perhaps it would be easier to isolate because I get line numbers, okay? Because when I compile, if I have any error, Java will point out and say, hey, in this line, you have made a mistake. Please go and check your code, okay? So having line numbers makes things easier to isolate, okay? So perhaps this Notepad++ uh, is a good uh, editor. Now, if you don't have Notepad++, 
just go right now while you're listening to this lecture go to google and type download notepad plus plus and it will quickly take you to the location and you can download it okay no big deal no need to download eclipse now you can try with eclipse later okay so remember when you compile you have to type you have to type java file name dot java Okay, once you finish compiling, okay, whatever file name you have, it is converted into class code, okay, a byte code. Now, what you have to do is you have to take that class code and type Java name of your file. No need to mention class, just the file name. And then it will execute and convert it into an executable. Okay. You have to remember another thing that Java is case sensitive programming language. Java is inherited from C, which is case sensitive, which is inherited from C programming language, which is case sensitive as well. Okay. And over here, even the file name that you give is case sensitive. Okay, so you have to be careful with all that. Now, let's go to the concept of class and constructor. The reason we are going to the, going through this uh, in the early part of the lecture, in the early part of this workshop, is because. A basic Java program needs a class, okay? Without a class, you cannot have a program, okay? So first of all, what is a class? You see, you see, if you look at the normal structured programming, we have got variables and functions, like C programming language. You have variables, you have functions. Uh, functions use the variables to do some behavior, correct? Now, what we can do is we can take these variables and functions. Uh, usually, in a structured programming language, the program starts from the main function, okay? From the main function, it goes and executes other functions. This function can execute other functions. This function can go and execute other functions, okay? So, uh, this is a typical example of a uh, procedural programming language. But in object-oriented programming, things are a bit different, okay? What you do is, in OOP, you take those variables and functions, okay? You take those variables and functions and put it inside a construct, okay? You put it inside a construct. What is inside this construct? Inside this construct, I have got variables and functions. And I call this construct a class. Okay? And the only way I can access this class is by using something known as a object. Okay. So what is a variable? Variable is a location that can store data. What is a function? Function is a section of code that does a particular function, uh, a particular uh, uh, behavior. Okay, so these functions work on these variables. So now, instead of having them separately doing their thing in your program, what we do is we combine them together inside a construct called a class. And we can create objects to this class. You can create multiple objects to access this class. Okay. This gives us the concept of reusability of code. 
you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If there is a class for CGI programming, just go and use the class or use the package and makes programming much more easier. Okay. So this is the benefit of object oriented programming. You have a blueprint in the form of a class. And then you create an object to access that class. If you want to make any changes, you can also change this. If you're not happy with this blueprint, you want some modification. Yes, you can modify it. No worries. Okay. So we can say a class is a template, a blueprint to create an object. An analogy is given to you. For example, we have a class modeling clay and using this class, we can create different kinds of objects. Okay. Okay. Like this object is only using perhaps the red clay, the green clay, the yellow clay. Okay. And perhaps the black clay, which I cannot find over here. Okay. So you get an idea that the object can actually go to the blueprint and copy whichever it wants, okay, to serve its purpose. So this is a new paradigm, we call it object-oriented programming. These are some of the benefits, the class concept, inheritance, what is inheritance, we'll study at the end. Uh, it gives us reusability of code, we can use this, uh, the code again and again, and polymorphism is making the functions behave in different way, okay? Now, when you have a class, there is something called the access specifier, because a class gives you encapsulation, gives you security. So by default, the members, that means the member variable and member function inside the class, by default, is always, is always private. By default, is always private. Private means cannot be accessed from outside the class. Public means can be accessed from outside the class. Protected means only in inheritance the child can access from the parent class, okay? That is the meaning of protected. Now we'll be using these access specifiers to make things clear. Finally, as we said, a class consists of variables and functions. One of the special functions that we have in a class is called a constructor. So what is a constructor? Constructor is a function which has the same name as the class name. What's the benefit of having a constructor? When you create an object of your class, your constructor is automatically executed. Now, if all these sounds Greek and Latin to you, no worries. I'll clarif clarify it very soon. Okay. Now, before we go to data types and variables, let's, let's do a little bit of coding. Okay. Uh, First of all, uh, let's just go to our command prompt. As we did a check, remember you do a check, type Java or Java to see whether your Java is installed. Once you get these series of extensions, that means yes, Java is installed, okay? Now, first of all, let's, let's do a basic uh, programming. Not, let's start with C programming language, okay? Uh, yeah, let's start with C, a basic C programming language. Uh, I'm using Dave C++ over here. Some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, console application, I say C project, click OK. Uh, save it on my C drive. Uh, my C drive is SSD, so it's faster. So I select that. Let's say uh c yeah c program okay 
So here it is. I create a basic C program. Okay. So just type. There's a big microphone in front of me, so typing is a bit difficult. Let's say uh, printf. Okay. Welcome to C programming language. Okay, that should suffice. Okay, now this is an IDE. Dave C++ so makes programming very easy. I don't have to, everything is in one environment. So I just go to execute, compile and run. I didn't put a semicolon. At the end, I again go to, I save, go to execute, compile and run. There, welcome to C programming language, okay? Now, this is, as you can see, a very straightforward structured procedural programming language. Starts from main method, and from here I can call other methods. I don't have any variables, but if I have any variables, it will work with other variables. Okay. Unfortunately, here you cannot create a class. Okay. You cannot create a class. It won't allow you to create a class. It is C programming language. Okay. Now, let's close this. Let's say yes, save changes. Let's start another one. Okay, another Dave C++, but this time, instead of doing a C programming language, I'm going to do C++, okay? So, yeah, C++, okay. Uh, this time, again, in C drive, I select CPP program. Okay. There you can see that the library has changed, the header files have changed because it's C++ now, okay? Now here I type C out, uh, well, same thing. Welcome to C++, okay? Now this is me doing structured programming in C++. Remember, C++ is somewhere in between, between the world of C and the world of Java. So you can do a structured as well as object-oriented. Now let's try this first, okay? Uh, yes, uh, I forgot one line. You have to type over here using namespace std. Standard library, otherwise your C out won't work. Okay, so save the changes and again execute, compile, and run. There, welcome to C programming language. Okay, without using any classes. Now, the benefit of C is remember, I told you you can do structured programming as well as object oriented. Okay, so now I'm going to modify this and create an object-oriented program. You see, I type class welcome. Okay, this is how you define a class in C++. Uh, don't forget the semicolon at the end of this class. Only in C++ we do this. Okay. So, here in my class, I can create a function. I can say uh, public, and then I can say, uh, yeah, the print, sorry, public, let's say void display. Here's my function. And the display is, Welcome to C++ 
programming, which is a C out operation. Okay, BNDL for a new line. So there's my display. Okay, now that I have a class, remember how do you access a class? You create an object of the class. Okay, so here it is. I create an object of my class. My class name is welcome. Remember we are programming in C++. Okay, welcome W. Object is created, object name is W. Then I say W dot w dot function name it shows me automatically display i want to go to display okay so i created the object of my class welcome use the w object to access display so it will show me welcome to c plus plus programming Okay, using the object to access the contents of a class, which is display. Now let's run this. Execute, compile and run. There, welcome to C++ programming. Now I'm going to modify this program. Okay, you see, I'm using C++. I initially programmed without using a class concept, then I change it to a class concept. Now I'm going to add a constructor, okay? I'm going to change this to a constructor, okay? What I do is I type over here a new name. A constructor is a function which has the same name as the class name. So this name should also be welcome. Okay, another thing, a constructor should not have any return type. So remove the word void. So what is the benefit of having a constructor? First of all, constructor is used to initialize variables. That means to give a first value to a variable. Also, when you have a constructor, now pay attention to this. This is very important. It's the same for Java. If you have a constructor, you don't need this second line. What? I don't need a second line? No, you don't. Just creating an object will execute your constructor. It's like magic. So the moment you have a constructor, you have a function with the same name as the class name. You don't need this line. You see, I'm going to get rid of this line. Save the changes. And compile and run. You see, it still runs beautifully, okay? This is the magic of a constructor. The moment you create an object, it executes your constructor, okay? You don't need a specific object to call the constructor. It automatically is executed, okay? Now, we have done a C program structured. We did a C++ structured. We did a C++. Uh, object-oriented program without a constructor, and now we are doing a C++ program with a constructor. Okay, now let's go into the domain of Java. Okay, so for Java, what I'm going to do is I'm going to perhaps go to my C drive. You see, I go to my C drive. Okay, in my C drive, let's say I create a, a, a folder. Okay, create a new folder in your C drive. Let's call it Java Progs, Java Programs, okay? And I'll be accessing it, you see over here, I will be just saying uh, CD Java Progs. That means change directory to Java Progs, okay? So everything will be in here. All my files will be over here so I can do Java and Java. I can compile and interpret quickly. So you also create a folder like that. 
So inside this folder, I'm going to create my first program, my first Java program, okay, using my notepad. Okay, if you can follow, uh, do so, please. Okay, what I'm going to do is, um, yeah, the same thing. Remember, the basic program in Java is a class. So your program starts with a class. You cannot have a program without a class. Okay. Public class. Uh, welcome. Okay, here we go. Okay. So. Public void, let's say display function okay. and then there we go system remember java is case sensitive and you say system s is capital out dot print line Welcome to Java programming language. Okay. So this could be my first function. Okay. Now, just like in C++ and in C programming language, you cannot have a program without a main function. The main function is integral part of the program. Sorry. The same goes for Java. You should have a basic function, okay? But if you look over here, in C++, the main function is outside the class, okay? But here, you can actually put it inside the class also. It should work okay. But in, in Java, it has to be inside the class, okay? Your main function is a part of the actual class, okay? So what I do is uh, I create my main function again, public static. Hopefully I'm not making any mistake. Void main. Okay. I've been programming for a long time. So many things are in my mind. Okay. So the first thing I have to do is create an object of my welcome class. So here we go. Welcome W. Now there's another thing in Java, which is different from C++. Uh, it, that is uh, creating a new operator to give memory. So we use a new operator and this generates a memory space okay and then using the object to access display that's it this should do it you see i have a function called display first of all i have a class a basic program which is a class okay and then i have got a function called display i've got the main function you cannot have a java program or C++ program or C program without a main function. In the main function, I create an object of my class welcome, and then I use the object to access the display function. Okay, now let's save this as we save it inside our C drive in Java progs. Okay, now what should be the name of this program. The name should be the name of the class, matching the case, word, letter by letter, okay? So I cannot give a name, small w, no, because the class name is capital W, so w, 
E L C O M E dot Java. Don't forget. The name should be the name of the main class. Once you're done, click save. Okay. So if somebody asks, uh, wait a second, what, what if I've got, let's say 10 classes, what name does it take? Answer is, it takes the name of the class where you have got the main function. Get it? If the main function is in that, in a particular class, your program should take that class's name. Okay. So we have made the changes. Now let's go to and compile. Okay, so what was the name of the program? Welcome. So Javak. Welcome dot Java. No errors. Okay, very lucky. So then I interpret Java. You see what happens when you compile? What happens? The moment you compile, a bytecode is created. That means welcome.class is created. Let's go to the location and have a look. Yeah. You see, the moment I compile welcome.java, it creates a bytecode, welcome.class. Now you have to interpret this bytecode. Okay. Java. Welcome. There, it shows you. Welcome to Java programming language. Okay, program works like a charm, no worries. Now, if you go back here, just like in C++, you have a constructor. Can I have a constructor inside my Java program as well? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. All you have to do is change the display over here, the name of this function display, change it to Welcome. So there. Now my function has the same name as the class name. Does it have the same benefit? That means when I create an object with the and give memory space, does it automatically execute the constructor? Yes. So you don't need this line. You can delete this line. You don't need it. Okay. So when I execute the moment I create an object of welcome class, it will look if there is a constructor. If there is a constructor, it will automatically execute this. Just like in C++, it works in the same way. So let's go and again compile and see. I save the changes, compile again, and then interpret. There. Doesn't work. Save the changes. Compile again. Interpret. Like, why not output? Let's try this without a new keyword. Save the changes. Interpret. Uh, compile should give you an uh, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps I'm missing something. Am I? Yeah. You see my problem, my dear students, what I did was a constructor does not have, a constructor does not have a return type, remember? A constructor should not have a void int or anything. There is no return type, okay? So now let's try again. Okay, there. It works now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you see, I made a mistake. I put a return type for my constructor. A constructor does not have a return type. Okay. 
So a basic program where you can see uh, Java working. Now, what since this is a workshop, uh, why don't you do the first program that is given to you uh, in the notepad? And perhaps let me have a look. Uh, I'm recording this session. I'm going to stop this, pause this recording. So continuing from where we left off. Now, next, let's go to data types and variables, which is an important aspect of any programming language. Okay. We're going to look at Java's primitive data types, uh, which are mainly uh, byte, short, integer, integer, long integer, float, double, character, and boolean. Okay. So these data types can hold negative values. Um, the keyword unsigned can be used to restrict the range of values to only positive numbers, just like other programming languages. Okay. A Boolean data type can store true or false values and character can store only a single character. Okay. Besides the primitive data types, we also have the abstract data type, okay? Uh, we have got quite a few of these, and one example of the one which we use a lot is the string data type, uh, which can store a series of strings and close in double quotes. Now, when you talk about variables, variables are locations in location in memory that can store data. Okay. All you have to do is mention the data type, mention the data type. Once you mention the data type, once you mention the data type, then you give the variable name, then you give the value. Very simple. Okay. And the syntax, if you see, is very similar to C, C++, okay? It's older relatives. So Java is still very much similar to C and C++, as you can see, okay? Uh, every time you want to store data in your computer's program, you have to create a variable, okay? We also have something else known as constants. Constant is just like a variable. The only difference is the value of a constant cannot change. Now, in uh, C programming language and C++ programming language, we used to use the keyword constant. But in Java, there's no such thing. In Java, if you want to make your variable constant, you use the final keyword. Okay, for example, static final, float data type, pi variable, 3.14. Now, this value cannot change. I can say number value can be updated. Okay, if I say next line number is equal to 7, the 4 will be overwritten and 7 will be stored. But you cannot do the same with this because I use the word final. Final means now it is a constant. Okay, so these are some tricks that you have to learn with regards to your programming language. Another thing you should know that just like C programming language and C++ programming language in Java as well, every variable must first be declared. You see, they use the word must. They don't use the word should must be declared. You have to first declare the variable and then use it, okay? It's the same just like C, C++, and Java, okay? 
In Python, we don't have to do that. Python, you straight away, you can use any variable depending on the value you give it. It knows whether it's an integer, it's a float, it's a string, okay? But not here in Java, we follow exactly the C and C++. You have to first declare the variable right at the top. Now let's look at some of your operators that we have. We have got the assignment operator, arithmetic, arithmetic assignment operators, relational, logical, conditional, or ternary operator, unary operators, new operator. You use the new operator to give memory, okay? So let's have a look. Assignment is used to give a value. It is represented by a equal to sign, okay? So here I'm creating a variable, F price, data type is float, is equal to, value is 43.2, okay? You also have arithmetic operators represented by addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and the modulo operator, okay? The modulo operator shows you the result, the remainder of a division, okay? The remainder of any kind of division. So over here, the remainder is zero, okay? So that is why we use the modulo operator. This is very handy, you know, in programs if we want to find out if the number is even number, odd number, and so on. You can also use arithmetic assignment operators. You can write your expression like this, f price is equal to f price minus one, or you can write f price minus equal to one, which means the same thing. This is the same as this, okay? Now we can also do the same thing with addition, multiplication and division and modulo. Okay. We also have relational. Okay. Now remember, inum is the same as three does not mean the same as assignment. You can even you say inum variable is equal to three. That means you're giving it a value of three. But over here, you're asking a question. Is the value of inum three? So the answer is either true or false. Okay. So that's the difference. In assignment, you just give a value. When you use a comparison, two equal to, then you're asking the question, is the value of inum three? True or false? That should be the result, okay? So every time you use a relational operator, you are asking a question. So it can be equal to, less than, greater than, not equal to, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, okay? So these are the different kinds of relational operator. And remember, your double equal to is the comparison operator asking the question whether this value is true or false. Okay? Get it? We also have logical operators in the form of and, or, and not. Okay? Represented just like in your C and C++, okay? The same uh, evolution of languages, okay? And, or, and not. And is two ampersand, or is two pipe symbol, okay? The pipe symbol is the one just above your enter key. If you look at the one above your enter key, you have got a, a forward slash, and above it is a stick in the form of, we call that the pipe symbol. 
We also have the unary operators. Why they call it unary operators? Because uh, it's one-sided, okay? It can be postfix or prefix. And unary operators have a special meaning. If you look at them, uh, this special meaning, uh, let's have a look. Look, uh, look at this example so you understand it better. I seem to have lost my, yeah, okay. Here, when I say inum one is equal to two, I'm giving a value to inum one. Next, I'm saying inum two is equal to plus plus inum. So this is prefix. In prefix, what happens is, in prefix, first, first, what they have to do is, let me try and use my, okay. In prefix, what we do is first, okay, increment, second, assignment. Okay, so that means first increment. That means increment the value of inum. Okay, so inum two plus one becomes three. Inum one becomes three. This should be inum one. I made a mistake. Okay, should be inum one. So inum one value becomes three, and then the three value is given to Inum two, okay. So the equivalent of this code is over here. So both inum one and inum two value will be three in this situation. What happens when you use postfix? In postfix, the situation is different. In postfix, first is assign. You see exactly the opposite. Second is increment. Okay, what does that mean? That means when I say inum one is equal to two, and then I say postfix inum plus plus, that means I'm saying first assign. That means two value will be given to inum two. The value of inum two becomes two. Then increment. Then the value of inum one will increment and become three. Now you see inum two value is two, but inum one value has changed to three. Get it? This is the difference between prefix and postfix. Because in prefix, it first increments, then assigns. In postfix, it first assigns the value and then increments. Okay. We also have the new operator in Java, which is used to allocate memory to an object. Okay. It can be used inside a method and its uses uh, can be either in this way, you create an object of your class, and then you can allocate memory to your object like this. Or you can do it even in one line like this. Depends on you. Both are acceptable. Okay, so before we go to control structures, let's do another program. I go again over here. Uh, File, new, new program, okay. Uh, what program should I type? Let's say, yeah. Public class 
um, mark, uh, let's say, sorry, average marks. Okay. Sorry. Public class average marks. Uh, now I'm going to use an input over here. So perhaps I need a package. I cannot do this program without a package. So a package is a collection of classes in Java. So import Java dot util dot asterisk means every package, every class inside that package. Okay, just import it. So it's going to import everything inside that. So here is my class average. Okay. And here is my public. You see, when you program, you indent everything, uh, whatever is inside a construct, okay? So you see, whatever is inside my class, I indent it one step in. I do the same thing with uh, my main method, okay? It's not a, a must, but it's rather a should. It makes your program readable, okay? So uh, what I do is I create two float values, float marks one, marks two, for example. Okay. And then I set up my input scanner. Input is equal to new scanner, which is your system dot in okay so that it can get the input from the keyboard so here next what i do is system dot out dot print line uh, please enter your, uh, let's say, calculus, uh, no, let's say your materials, okay, materials marks. Okay. And then you take the input. You say, let's say M1 is equal to, that means the input is coming through the keyboard. Dot next float. Okay, this is the function we use to get the value, sorry. To get the value and put it inside our M1 variable. Okay, then we do the same. I don't feel like typing. I can just copy and paste to make things easier. Paste system dot out of print line. Please enter your mechanics marks. Mechanics marks. So now change it to same thing. M two input dot next float. Yes, correct. And finally, what I do is. I want to display the average of my materials and mechanics marks. Okay. System dot out dot print line. Your average 
box is uh, plus should work yeah plus m1 plus m2 divided by 2 yeah hopefully there's no error okay So let's just save this. We call this uh, class average marks. Average marks dot uh, Java. Okay, save the changes. You have to be careful sometimes so you don't make spelling mistakes. Okay, so here we go. Java average marks dot Java. No errors. Okay. And then you type Java. Interpret the bytecode. Please enter your materials marks. Materials, let's say I got 79. Mechanics, let's say I got 98. My average is 88.5. Okay, so program works fine. Okay, so here I'm using two float variables, asking the user to enter the input and then calculating the average marks. Okay, now again, I want you all to go and try your program number two and then share your screen, uh, the program number two which is given to you. And then share your screen and show it to me. Okay. Let me pause the recording. So let's continue where we left off. Okay. So control structures are another important aspect, just like variables and constants are present in all programming language languages similarly you have got uh, control structures which are an important aspect of any programming language so let's have a look at them uh, decisions are one of the most important aspect decision making and this decision making actually uh, results into relational uh, you have to use relational operators, which results into uh, Boolean operations, which is true or false. Okay. Uh, based on that, we have got if, if else construct, and we have got switch case constructs. Okay. Uh, we can look at some examples there. If this uh, Boolean expression is true, it will execute the statement. If this Boolean expression is false, it will go to else and execute the statement. Okay. So that's how it's supposed to work. Okay. Switch has got multiple cases. Okay. For example, you can't. Uh, put the variable that is going to be uh, tested inside the switch keyword and then based on what you enter it will check all the cases since you have entered three it will show you this one march okay a switch construct consists of multiple cases okay and these cases will be executed based on what value is given or what value the user enters. For example, here, the case is three, so it will execute and show you March. If I enter nine, what happens? 
Anyone? If I enter the value 9, what happens? Anyone would like to try? Yes, very good, Andy. Well, well said. Yes. Yes, Hedges is also right. It will go to, if you enter 9, it will go to, because there is no 9 value over here, it will go to the default and will show you invalid month. Okay? Now, observe another thing over here. After every entry, you're using the keyword break. If you don't use the keyword break, what happens is it will jump to the next case. So you have to use the keyword break. For example, if I don't have a break over here and enter tree, what happens is it will show me March and then it will also show me April. Get it? So after every case, you have to use the keyword break. So it gets out of the switch case construct. We got break in the loops as well. So this is how we use our uh, switch case construct and if construct. We'll look at some more examples later. Another control uh, statement that you can use, uh, control code that you can use is loops, iteration, uh, which is very useful in programming. It allows us to loop a certain section of the code uh, as many times as uh, we want, okay? Uh, going in circles is actually uh, uh, good sometimes, as long as you get out of that circle at at certain point, okay? Uh, otherwise, it would be like, uh, you know, going in circles in a desert. You end up, you know, you create a virus. Your program will be an infinite loop <laughs> and it will feed on your memory and your uh, uh, CPU the re resources and then <laughs> nothing it, it, else it will, it will do. So uh, you have to use loops in such a way that at some point you get out of the loop. Okay. Now. Uh, in Java, just like in C and C++, we have got loops in form of while, do while, and for loop. Let's look at them in detail. For example, here, I create a class while counter. In my main function, I declare a variable counter is equal to 1. I say while counter is less than or equal to 10. So starts from 1. Is 1 less than or equal to 10? Yes goes inside the loop and then on the screen it shows me one okay and then this one value changes and becomes two then it again since it's a loop it again goes to the condition okay and tests the condition is two less than ten yes goes inside and then shows you on the screen two then two becomes three. Again, it goes to the condition, is three less than 10? Less than or equal to 10? Yes, goes inside, shows you three. So this continues, okay, until it shows you three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, okay? Because it increments to 10, then comes here, is 10 less than or equal to 10? Yes. 10 is not less than, but equal to 10. So this is true, goes inside and shows you 10. So it has shown you from numbers 1 to 10 so far. Okay. Then again, plus plus counter, 10 becomes 11. Then goes back to the condition. Is 11 less than or equal to 10? No. The moment it becomes false and it's not true anymore, it gets out of the loop. It gets out of the loop and goes to the next line of code. You see how loop works? So as long as this condition is true, the loop will continue. Now looking at the loop, you can see you have got an initial value that you use and then you have a condition and then you have a re 
initialization. So every loop has got three parts, okay? Initial value that you give, okay? Let me try and use my pen here. Uh, it's not so easy. Initial value, okay? Then your loop condition, And finally, the last one is your group reinitialization. Okay? So that's what we have. You see, initial value variable is declared. Then test the condition. If this is true, goes inside the loop. If this is false, it doesn't go inside the loop. If this is true, goes inside the loop. And in the loop, you have got reinitialization. Every time you should increment or decrement or have a user enter a new value. If you don't do this, you will get an infinite loop. Okay? It will continue forever, never stopping. Okay? And this will feed on your system resources like memory and CPU. So you have to be careful. So this is while. Now I'm going to do the same loop, but using do while. If you look at the difference between while and do while, you see in while, the condition is up here. But in do while, it's down here, which gives you a, immediately a very clear difference. Okay, over here, if the condition is false, it will never go inside. Over here, it will go inside at least once. Even if the condition here is false, since the statement is before the condition, you see the statement is before the condition, so it goes in once, executes this, then only tests the condition. This is the only difference between while and do while loop. Sometimes you want the statement to be executed at least once. Then don't use while loop, use a do while loop in those situations. Okay. Finally, we have the for loop. In for loop, just like the while loop, it's the same um, idea. What we do is in for loop, our initialization, condition, reinitialization, all in the same line. Okay. It will execute this first, then it will go and check. First, it will execute this. It will check whether it's true. If it's true, it will execute the statement. And then it will reinitialize. Then again, it will test the condition. Then the loop will continue as long as it's true. Okay? So this is your for loop. Now, let's try it out. I'm going to go again and, you know, program and try it out. Let's start a new one, file, uh, new, okay. Uh, let's create a program that, you know, does something over here. Let's say, nothing fancy, let's say public. Let's create a program that results into an infinite loop. Okay, yeah, infinite, yeah, public class infinite. I'm going to create a program that results into an infinite loop okay if you can keep up please do so okay so what i do is inside my class infinite i create my main function public static void main okay consisting of string Arts. So my string arguments is done. Now here is my main function. Inside the main function, I'm going to have, uh, let's say for loop. Yeah, why not? For, okay. Uh, the for loop has got initialization, condition, reinitialization, all in the same line. So integer. Uh, counter uh, is equal to, let's say, one. 
Yeah. Then uh, counter. Uh, I want it to be always true. So I say counter is greater than zero. Okay. So this will make sure that the counter value is always true. Because even if I increment, the value will always be true. And then counter plus plus. Okay, so there we go. System dot out dot print line. Spelling print line. Um, what do I say? Let's say, uh, This one we take it. This is the same as in C, person D. Uh, yeah, I want to show the values counter. Have I made any mistake? Well, let's find out. Save the changes in my Java programs. What should be the name of my file? What's the name of the class? Infinite. So the name of the file also should be the same, okay? Infinite dot Java, okay? Save the changes, okay? Now what I do is I go and try it out, okay? Java infinite dot Java. Okay, let's go and see what is the error. Integer counter is equal to one, counter is greater than zero, counter plus plus system dot out dot print line. Oh. import java dot util uh, on the classes okay any other mistakes let's just have a look infinite is the name correct? Infinite.java. Uh, any idea what I'm doing wrong? Uh, perhaps this one, I have to use printf. Don't need this. Sorry. Because I'm using person D, so it should be printf. Okay, let's try. Again. Yes, yeah, that was the problem. Okay, printf, as in C programming language. Okay, remember they are very much related Okay, so now I'm going to interpret. There you can see I just created it 
an infinite loop and it works very good. I can stop this infinite loop just pressing control C, it stops it, okay? Now what I'm going to do, just observe, just for, you know, for trying it out, we can change it to a while loop, okay? Remember while loop, initialization is outside, okay? There we go. Uh, condition is right in here. And your reinitialization comes inside your while loop. Okay. Here. Okay, done. Now, let's compile again. And interpret again gives you the same result okay now change this to do while loop there we go bring it down okay you have to put a semicolon at the end so the compiler doesn't think you're starting a new while that means this while is a do while so here we go with do okay so Save and again compile, interpret, same thing. Okay, you see, I just changed from one loop to another loop. Okay, so. What we do now, I ask you to do the same program, okay? To the same program before we can go to the last concept, which is inheritance. Do uh, one of the programs uh, from the list of the codes that I've given you and show it to me, okay? Okay, my dear students, continuing, uh, from where we left off, okay? The last aspect that I want to go through is the concept of inheritance, okay? Uh, now, I have given you some programs on inheritance. You can have a look at it, okay? Uh, we cannot go into details now because time is of the issue. Uh, time is uh, an issue, I mean. Uh, but I will give you an idea of what inheritance is. Okay, uh, the whole idea of inheritance is uh, having the concept of uh, a parent class and a child class, okay? Uh, a parent class as in, uh, let's say I create a parent class, uh, we call it uh, class, class, father, sorry. Okay. Now class father, let's say has got uh, variables. Okay, variable one, variable two, and it can also have a function, let's say, function one, okay? Okay, now, this is class father. Now what I do is I come here and create another class. Okay, we call it uh, class child. Okay, as we say over here, see the keyword that we use over here is, you see, we use the keyword. Uh, Uh, 
I haven't mentioned it here. Yeah, we, we use the keyword over here, which is uh, extends, okay? Uh, this is not the exact uh, code, but it's okay. Just uh, get an idea, extends father. Okay, now what does this mean? This means that if I create an object of child, if I say child, okay, C, this object C can access child. Yes, it can. This C can also access variable one, variable two, function one get it this is the concept of in inheritance whereby the child class can access the members of the parent class okay so usually this is used in programming where the general code we put it inside the base class or the super class and the specialized code, we put it inside the child class or the derived class, okay? This is a feature that we have in C++. We have it in all object-oriented programming like C++, like Java, and so on, okay? So the object of child, in this case, C, can access the variables of child, let's say v4, v5. It can access its own variables. It can also access the variables of the parents and the function of the parents, as long as they are public or protected. Okay, protected means only the child can access. But the relationship is one way. That means the object, which is C, is the only one which can access. If you create an object of the father, which is F, F can only access what is in father. F will not be able to access what is in the child. Okay, remember that. This relationship is always one way. The child can access whatever belongs to the parent, but the parent cannot touch whatever belongs to the child. Okay, so this is the concept of inheritance. And in Java, the whole, I just like in C, the whole idea of inheritance is reusability of code. The parent class is known as the base class, okay, or the super class. And the derived class, it's called the subclass or the derived class or the child class, okay? Now, we have got different kinds of inheritance. We have got single inheritance, uh, hierarchical in inheritance, multiple inheritance, and multi-level inheritance. Now in Java, unfortunately, there is no multiple inheritance. We can simulate multiple inheritance by using certain tricks. Okay, but not exactly like C++, we have multiple inheritance. Python, we have multiple inheritance, but we don't have that in uh, Java, okay? So having said that, I've given you some examples, okay, uh, of inheritance, simple examples. Please have a look in your program and uh, understand. So in this, uh, in this time, short time that we have given, we were given in this workshop, I hope I have got all, I mean, I, you have learned Java to a minimal degree, but the whole idea of this workshop is to push you and get you started in the concepts of Java, okay? So what are those concepts? Once you know, how do you, uh, create variables by using data types and use 
control structures. In Java, use the class and construct a concept. Once you understand these, you can get started. You can build upon those knowledge. Okay. You have already started programming in Java. These basic lessons gets you started. Now, all you have to do is explore this further. Okay, go to YouTube and look at other videos and see how can I polish my understanding of Java? How can I use other packages, other classes, for example, to create a, to create a graphical user interface and so on? Okay. So before we close, anyone has any questions? Okay, let me just stop the recording.